being able to take information that you can get and glean that intelligence from that and then use that to get it to the right people, like our executives or our defenders or whoever that is that needs oh, that, yeah. that intelligence yeah. to help them make decisions to either protect a building or protect a network or bank accounts or whatever it is, you are ahead, a step ahead of the actors, right? And that's really where you want to be. Welcome to Unspoken Security by Zero Fox the raw and gritty podcast for cybersecurity professionals who want to understand how threat actors are leveraging the internet. In each episode, your host, AJ Nash, engages with various industry experts to dissect current trends, share practical insights, and address the blunt truths surrounding security. Ultimately, the lessons learned will enable security professionals to take an intel-driven, proactive approach to physical and cybersecurity that extends past the perimeter. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unspoken Security, brought to you by ZeroFox, the only unified external cybersecurity platform. I'm your host, AJ Nash, and for those who don't know me personally or are first-time listeners, I'm a traditional intelligence guy who spent nearly 20 years in the intelligence community, both within the U.S. Air Force and then as a defense contractor. Most of that time was spent at NSA. I've been in the private sector for about eight years now, primarily building or helping other people build effective intelligence-driven security practices. I'm passionate about intelligence, security, public speaking, mentoring, and teaching. I'm also deeply committed to servant leadership, which is why I completed my master's degree in organizational leadership at Gonzaga University. Go Zags! The goal of this podcast is to bring all of these elements together with some incredible guests and some authentic, unfiltered conversations, even debates, about a wide range of challenging topics most of us are faced with today. This will not be the typical polished podcast. You may hear or see my dog. She's right over here right now. People may swear here. We may argue or debate, and that's all okay. Think of this as the podcast. You know, this podcast is like a conversation you might overhear at a bar after a long day at one of the larger cybersecurity conferences. These are the conversations we usually have when nobody's listening. So today, our guest is Lisa Ackerman. Lisa is an Air Force veteran, security and intelligence expert, and the current deputy CISO for the British multinational pharmaceutical and biotechnology giant GSK. Lisa, to help the audience understand you and better connect with you, like obviously we know each other because we've been friends for a while and you should pick better friends, but to help the (laughs) audience connect, can you tell us more about your background and and a little bit about, you know, your current role at GSK? What's that look like? Absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Glad to see you put this together. Uh, So as AJ said, uh, my name is Lisa Ackerman and I'm currently the uh, Deputy CISO and Vice President of Cybersecurity Strategy and Solutions at GSK. I've been in place for almost around 10 months now and recently coming from the financial sector where I was the global head of cyber threat intelligence. And then prior to that, I worked for the U.S. government in some capacity my entire life. So I joined the Air Force right out of high school. I was a SIG enter for those of you who know what this is. Did it, it, da, 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 did it, it. That's my role. Only I listened. I didn't actually send it. So I was in the Air Force for a bit. Like I said, signals intelligence. And then I got out of the Air Force and worked for many large and small contractors uh, supporting the government, and then did a stint as civil service in the middle of my career, where I was an information system security manager for a military base. So I've seen a lot of different things. I've had a lot of different kinds of roles, never focused in one particular area other than intelligence for almost all of that time. I've been working in cybersecurity since the late 90s, and I am very passionate about teaching people about cybersecurity and cyber awareness. I actually just, I was quoted saying as it should be second nature, like brushing your teeth. Mm. Also, it should be like uh, crossing the street, whether you look left or right, if you're in the other part of the world, make it just part of who you are uh, because cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. I like to use intelligence to support that and being threat driven in everything that I do. At GSK, my role is different than what I have done in the past. Here, I'm actually responsible for our cybersecurity architecture and engineering, making sure that we build the right solutions for our defenders to protect the organization. So taking what I've done and applying that to what our defenders need, it's a really good benefit for GSK, I think, and for me, because I get to learn a lot about building the solutions that we need versus just using them. Yeah, that's very cool. I remember uh, when you said you were going to move over to GSK, how excited I was for you. I mean, it's it's an interesting gig, right? A huge company, massive landscape, obviously. Everybody knows who GSK is. And and I say that out loud. For those who may not realize the branding, GlaxoSmithKline is, some people may still remember, remember that name, right? But GSK is, is everywhere, right? 
And I was really excited for them, frankly, as much as for you, because I, you know, we go Thank back you. a ways. Obviously, and we'll talk about your background, but I think they were very lucky to get you in and to have a chance to really, you know, add to their skill set and, and get stronger and safer. So it was pretty exciting. And, you know, as an Intel monkey myself, seeing somebody with an Intel background move into that CISO track, and I know we're going to talk a little about that going forward, is interesting, right? There aren't a lot of folks who came out of the IC, came out of the Air Force and, you know, intelligence backgrounds who've moved into that track yet. I think we're starting to see more of it. So I definitely want to dig into that a little bit and, and see, you know, hear from you on, on how that's been going and, and how that feels. But I'm, I'm pretty excited about learning about that. And obviously, you know, thrilled that you were able to make it today. You know, we're lucky to have you to have you with us. So and interesting for anybody who didn't recognize the did dot dot, you know, obviously it's Morse code. At least it was what we would call a diddy bopper in the Air Force. You know, it's, she was Morse code. I was a linguist. So we sit next to each other a lot of times. It's just her language is all dits and dots. And ours is something that you might get to read on a menu at a restaurant. So very cool stuff, similar backgrounds. All right, so let's jump into the heart of the discussion today. So today's podcast is entitled, If You Aren't Using Intelligence, You're Chasing the Threats. Now, listen, that, that's a pretty bold title. You know, I, we helped come up with it. So, you know, obviously, you know, we both feel pretty strongly about the concept of being proactive. I know that, right? You know, we talk a lot about proactive security. You know, it's, you know, if you talk about, say, looking at JP2-0, you, know, you talk about being on a, on a proactive scale, you know, and, and everything else is reactive, right? And, and I'm a big believer in that. You know, I've, I've leaned into that heavily. I know you have too. You've, you've built teams and career off of this. So, you know, with that as the foundation for the chat, I do want to take a look at some comparatives here. You know, what do you see having come out of the government space and been in the private sector now uh, and having such a wide aperture? You know, what do you see as the biggest differences in how we think about security, physical and cyber, really? you know, in the private sector as compared to, say, military and defense backgrounds? So I think um, it's changed a lot just since I've been in the private sector. When I first came into the private sector, I got asked a lot, why intelligence? Because a lot of private entities did not really have a big intelligence organization. Some of the bigger firms did, right? But the smaller ones, no. But we've had a lot of events since then that have actually turned people's heads and really want to understand the value of intelligence. I used to laugh, actually, when I got the question, what, what value is there in cyber intelligence? <laughs> and I would just laugh because to me, it's second nature, like I mentioned before, right? So I think about that kind of stuff all the time. But the lay person does not. You know, you got our kids who are all over TikTok and don't oh, understand uh, don't understand why anybody would want their data. They don't know the term influence operations, right? Or even other social media, you know, we're, we're so prone to brag about what we do and, and how we do it. And then just kind of yeah. changing that mindset, right? I, even from a physical and a cyber perspective, you know, in the government, physical and cyber were together, right? We, we hand in hand, we did it. When I was civil service, uh, I actually was part of a group called the Threat Working Group. And we brought in physical and cyber threats. And we talked about it as a group and decided, you know, do we need to raise or lower our threat or information conditions. You're familiar with that term. We did it as a group and we took that recommendation to the base commander and then we implemented controls around that, right? Either to protect the base or our users, our network. I mean, I was doing phishing exercises where phishing was even a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it was, it's just an adjustment, right? And so, but physical and, and cyber were very much together. In the private sector, you see a little bit of that depending on who's running operations, but generally they're separate. But during COVID and the Russia-Ukraine war, you really started seeing those come together because intelligence brings in a lot of information. And it could be related to fraud at an ATM. It could be related to protests at a building. You know, you want to make sure that you're getting that information to the right people because the whole value of intelligence is decision advantage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can sum it up in those two words. If the more information that you have, the better you are equipped to make decisions and smart decisions at that. And so trying to bring that concept in because a lot of organizations are very risk focused. Mm -hmm. What's my risk of this? What's my risk of that? Mm -hmm. Well, a really good friend of mine uh, that you and I both know advised me once that you can't understand your risk without intelligence. And I heard that and I took that and I drive with that, right? But really, if you think about it from that perspective, it puts it puts it into perspective, right? Being able to take information that you can get and glean that intelligence from that and then use that to get it to the right people, like our executives or our defenders or whoever that is that needs oh, that, that intelligence yeah. to help them make decisions to either protect the building or protect the network or bank accounts or whatever it is, you are ahead, a step ahead of the actors, right? And that's really where you want to be, regardless of who the actor is in this case. But that's my take on it. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, those are some excellent points, right? You know, I, I think the difference between the government side and, and the private sector, right? Obviously, I came out as well. And I think the first one was the big one, right? You said like 
just helping people understand like why what's the mindset what's intelligence why do we think about it this way you know why does it matter like i spent a lot of time on just what is intelligence i was surprised at how much time i was going to put into explaining that which is nobody's fault it's just my ignorance having come out of the government space you know we spend so much time doing this and you, know, you said you've been doing this your whole life right i know you know before we got on you mentioned you went in right out of high school like you were 17 mm -hmm. when you're in the air force yes <laughs> so like literally your entire adult life you've been doing intel i was a little bit older i went in my t early 20s but the thing is yeah this is all normal for us like this is how we think i didn't realize how differently we in the intel community think until you know i started making comparative notes with just like friends you know and, and you talk about just anything from like going to dinner to traveling whatever and you realize that what we think about is just different right that's second nature thing you know i i i still look for like exit paths when i go to restaurants and people don't do that like worst case scenario thought process pop into my head on all sorts of things people are like oh you're a downer i'm like no it, i'm not negative this is just how i think like i don't think this will happen but here's the worst case i like to prepare in advance for stuff and you just realize like it's second, like you said, second nature. I've been doing it for decades. So security. I've never seen my back to the door. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Every restaurant, you can tell when we get seated, you know, which side of the table I want. You know, people are with me. Don't have to ask, you know, exactly which side of the table I'm going to want. You know, so, you know, we go into movie theaters. And I'm looking for people with packages. People are like, oh, you know, I'm like, I had that happen. It wasn't that long ago. I, well, now it was because I'm old. It was a few years ago in Maryland. We had uh, folks show up. We went to a movie. It was one of the Batman movies. And somebody came in with a suitcase and sat down next to us. Now, it turns out at the mall in Maryland where I used to live is near the airport. I guess it wasn't an uncommon occurrence for people to have delayed flights or whatever, and so they'd catch a movie. But there had just been a serious attack at a movie theater somewhere else in the country, and I was very unnerved. And this guy also was just acting sort of sketchy. And so, you know, we ended up leaving before the movie started. I was like, I, he sat next to me. He was, he was in a perfect spot if you want to blow up the theaters in the middle of the theater. Like, he had all the right locations. I was like, I'm sure he's nothing, but I just couldn't get comfortable. So I left and, and had to talk to the manager. I got my, my money back. But I also was trying to explain to them, maybe there's a better policy here. Maybe you can lock up bags someplace where they I couldn't. I mean, they had no understanding mm -hmm. why I was this guy. Why, why would I even think this way? I was like, no, I don't know. I can't. But I was like, this is that's just the way we think. Right. And so, of course, I ruined the night for myself and my date who, you know, we were fine. We didn't see the movie. It, the theater did not blow up. Uh, we saw the movie well, another good. day. Yeah. But I couldn't not see it. Once I saw this guy and I kept watching his behavior, and I was like, there's just something off here. And maybe there was it just wasn't that apparently. You often get accused of being paranoid. Oh yeah, often. And I try to tell people I am not paranoid because you know, you know, I'm just prepared. There is a difference, right? I don't mm -hmm. think these things are going to happen. I don't, I don't tell people you know scenarios and start planning them out like I think it's coming. I I do these things to be prepared. There's a difference. It's subtle and can be lost on people. I think, but no, I don't consider myself paranoid. Now there's also the old joke, you know, I, if if you think everybody's following you, you're not a certain paranoid. Maybe they really are, but I don't think they really are. Yeah. I just but, tell everybody I'm not paranoid. I'm educated. That's right. And and that's the challenge, right? You know, so mm -hmm. I will say, you know, a couple of years ago, I mean, listen, for the last several years now, the company, or the country's had some turmoil. I don't have to go down mm -hmm. details. We're not getting very political. Mm -hmm. Let's just say the, the country is not in agreement on a lot of things. There's a lot of things going on and it's become challenging. Right. And, and we've seen some of that. Obviously in security, we see it in physical security and cyber and we see, you know, uh, fomenting of discontent on social media and where that goes. And we've seen more, you know, random acts of violence and whatever it might be indoctrination. So there was a point uh, a few years ago now where I was like, you know, I need to start preparing for some worst case scenarios. And so I sat down with my girlfriend at the time and said, I, I need to get you prepared so you don't think I've gone crazy because <laughs> I'm about to do some things that you might think mean that I've just somehow snapped. So I want you to know exactly my thought process here. I'm just as rational as I was yesterday. I've just to reach a point where I think there's some decisions I'd like to make and some things I'd like to acquire for worst case scenarios that I didn't currently own. And so I didn't go full prepper and dig, you know, dig a trench in the backyard. I don't have, you know, pallets of MREs and, and all that, but I did buy some things that I didn't own that I didn't think I would need. And I said that, but I was like, but if you do, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, better to have it, not need it than need it, not have it. Exactly. And being prepared isn't a bad thing. You know, when the pandemic happened and people were stocking up on toilet paper, you know, I bought uh, 50 pounds of dried milk and, a, you know, and, and like 10 pounds of yeast. I was like, I got a year's worth of milk and yeast. If things really go bad. Toilet paper won't be our biggest concern, frankly. You know, I also bought guns and ammo. You know, I can get all the toilet paper I want, I suppose. If things, if you really think society is going to end, I, I don't think toilet paper is going to be your solution. But yeah, it's, you know, those kind of things, right? But like you said, so people don't think you're paranoid. Having that discussion, be like, listen, I haven't snapped. Nothing's changed about me. These are the reasons I'm making these choices. I know it's an edge case and it probably won't matter but I don't want to find us in a bad spot and have to explain. I knew this was a possibility and I didn't prepare for it. I thought about it and did nothing. 
you know, so I'm, I'm never out of toilet paper now though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, it's funny when that run happened just by pure luck, because I I'm ADD and don't pay attention to things a lot. We had just bought like a hundred rolls. And so I went out and bought a hundred more. I, I had an endless supply. It turned out of toilet paper very quickly. I didn't mean to hoard it. We just, you we could sold it. it. <laughs> well, yeah, I probably, I mean, we buy it, you know, bulk, bulk buying places and we just happen to have a bunch of it. I did buy an inordinate amount of uh, hand sanitizer. I, I have gallons of it still probably around here and masks and, you know, all those things. I, I did buy some stuff, but I mean, I bought like water purification stuff in case things went really, really bad. You know, I, I went in some directions where we could be more self-sufficient, built the house here. And I'm in the process of making it more self-sufficient. I'm probably going to get a whole home generator for the twice a year to probably get used, but I don't want to be without power. The power grids are, you know, changing a bit and I don't want to be in that position. I might put solar on the house, you know, it's preparing, but again, not going down, you know, too far down the rabbit hole. Right. And that's tough. I think for folks like you and me, because like you said, we're educated. We've seen a lot. It's easy to say these things are possible because they are, we know they are, and others may not realize they are, but they become more probable for us if you see them a lot, I think. And I have to remind myself how it's improbable. So it's possible improbable, which yeah. I realize is a whole nother thought process people don't have. I've had to explain how many times, I got to ask you, how many times have you had to explain to people that are seen possible and probable and likely and less likely and more likely? And, more times you know, than I can count. <laughs> uh -huh. I, all the time, I try to explain to people, you know, I don't speak in absolutes very often. I try not to. But the difference between possible and probable is, is big, you know, and mm -hmm. in most people's lives, it's not. It's just a, it's, they're almost synonymous. So Intel people think differently. We speak differently. So, yeah, I found that, that was something I really had to explain. So I, when I first went into the private sector, I was working with uh, an organization who was in the process of signing an agreement to do business with a company in a nation that could be challenging. I'm going to really kind of clean this a bit so I don't fall across any lines. And so I had a private discussion and said, have you talked to the State Department yet? Mm -hmm. And this person looked at me like I had three heads and said, what, why would I talk to the State Department? And I said, well, there are some challenges with the company you're talking about and some of the individuals. I'm curious if you've you know, done the security assessment, et cetera. And, and I was clearly alien. And I finally had to say, I said, listen, I don't know how to be too much more clear about this. You know where you hired me from. It's my first job in the private sector. Our first conversation, I am aware of the company and some of the people you're discussing. You're going to have to draw your own conclusions as to why I might be have that awareness already and whether what I'm saying makes sense. Mm -hmm. It wasn't persuasive at all. They went ahead and signed the contract anyway. Like It didn't matter. And I was like, okay, this is a whole different world. I can't explain everything I need to explain. And some people just aren't going to see things the way I see them. And so I spent a lot of time instead trying to mitigate risks that were related to that relationship. And I was like, all right, I'll just gonna help from that side. But I realized in that moment, and you know, these were experienced, professional, executive people. They didn't get here from nothing. Mm -hmm. But... I saw we had a completely disconnect on something that they just had no background on. And, and I'm sure I seemed paranoid right away. Like, we do business right. all over the world. It's not yeah. a big deal to do business with some of these foreign companies. I'm like, some people you got to be more careful about. So, I, you know, no. oh, yeah, yeah, it's it's remarkable. And I think another good point you mentioned was, you know, having worked with the threat group where physical and, and cyber were together, right, where they mm -hmm. worked hand in hand. I don't know about you. Uh, I've seen. I think that's improving it from what I'm, my perception is that's improving in the private sector, but it didn't used to exist at all. Right. They were just sort of siloed. So have, I, have you seen the same thing that that's connecting more now? Yeah, absolutely. And especially during COVID. Um, and then again, with Russia and Ukraine, like for, for COVID, you know, uh, I was in the oh, financial yeah. sector then and information sharing is huge there. Right. And we were getting lots of information, both physical and cyber and legal and retail. I mean, we were getting all kinds of, of, of information to share. Yep. And then you start seeing protests at, you know, different kind of facilities because of either they were creating a vaccine or mm -hmm. something to do with, with, with it. Right. And so we would share sure. that information with, with our physical security people. And then, you know, if we had locations where those protests were happening, they were able to take that information and go, you know, put protections in place or, you know, notify the, the residents of those buildings that there's going to be protests and, and get defenses exactly. ready. You know, those kind of things are, are very important. And then, where I'm at now, we have manufacturing facilities, not just, you know, we don't just do everything online, right? right so sure. We uh, not, are, are not just a pharma company, but we also do manufacturing. So we want to make sure and share that information as we get it. So there's really big uh, shift, if you will, in, in especially like with Russia, Ukraine, where that's at, you have people who are in global in global locations near near they might they might not be in the the war zone but they're near it and imagine an Aaron missile hitting a nato country sure and a lot of different problems right so <laughs> using but using that intelligence to inform 
our decision makers on, do I need to move my people? Do I need mm-hmm. to, you mm-hmm. know, make some changes? Do we need to have more resiliency in place? Which is another thing we could have. Yes. That's done. Yes. Right. But how, how do you take that intelligence and use it to your advantage again? And, and I'm starting to see a big shift. Or I've been seeing a shift uh, in that physical um, cyber relationship. Uh, it's mm-hmm. very, very critical. Yeah, I, you make excellent points, obviously. And and the connection between physical and cyber and and those those potentials that people don't necessarily think about. Like you said, you know, what about an errant missile? I'm sure there are people doing business right now in countries that are adjacent to the hostilities who are like, well, we're, we're hundreds of miles away. We This isn't our problem. We're, we're politically neutral on the subject. Nobody cares about us. And, and, and helping people understand bad things can happen that aren't intended. You can become a target by accident or somebody can perceive you as part of their target package. Even if you haven't, you may think you're neutral, but somebody might've decided you're not something you did you know, feeds a, a third party, you know, supply chain, whatever. You know, adversaries will will decide who they're going to go after sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And helping people understand you you may not be uninvolved just because you want to be uninvolved or or intend to be or plan to be or are trying to be. You may still become involved and become a target, right? Both physically yep. or or through cyber. I think that's a really, really good point. Well, insider so, threats another use case, right? Oh God, if, you, yeah. <laughs> if you think about oh. it from an insider uh, risk or insider threat perspective. Mm -hmm. I've heard both names uh, used, right? But the more that you can connect those dots between what somebody's doing physically and what they're doing in the cyber world, and you start connecting those dots, you can really paint a big picture and it gives you a lot of good evidence if you need to go after someone or actually helps you prevent things from happening if you are sharing information and and do that collaboration. That's, That's another really important use case for physical and cyber. 100%. And I think you make a good point about, you know, whether, I think it probably should be called insider risk and not insider threat, right? It's, I mean, we can have this discussion, right? You know, it's the threat plus, you know, opportunity gives you that risk factor, right? And I think most people are really concerned about what's the risk of something happening, whether it's an insider or outsider. You know, there's there's threats everywhere, I suppose. You know, the disgruntled employee is a threat. But if they have no, if the disgruntled employee has no access to anything, the risk is pretty low, right? You know, the disgruntled employee is is a one day a week groundskeeper who never can get inside of a facility. They're, they're, the, the risk is probably pretty low. If the disgruntled employee is a C-level executive with, you know, with, access to everything, the, the risk is much higher. Uh, everybody in, in, or in, insider already knows this, of course. So I think you make a good point about the risk. And you mentioned that earlier, and it was a point I probably should have doubled down on. You know, Intel, helping people make informed decisions, which you've said a couple of times, Intel is about decision making, right? And I think risk is a huge part of this factor, is, is people want to make decisions based on risk. We can't stop everything, and you know this, I know this, right. everybody listening I'm sure does. There's always going to be a risk. You know, we, we, we're, the goal is to be able to quantify it and to manage it and to accept what that is and you know mitigate what you can. And I think that's the key piece. You know, that we talk about with Intel and becoming more proactive and, and understanding everything. We don't want to have risks that we don't even know are, exist, right? So, with that in mind, I, I got to get to the next question. I keep telling people there's three questions that we have for the show, and it sort of is. There's a lot of sub questions in there. I'm going to get po- poked by people, I'm sure, but I, I am trying to stick to the three. And so, the second one we had on here, you know, without violating any confidence, obviously. Can you talk a bit about your journey? So your last role, you know, before GSK was at State Street. That's where you and I met, obviously. And I'll, I'm interested in your journey there. You went from being the new hire to eventually the global head of cyber threat intelligence. I mean, you built and led this this incredible intelligence team that was responsible for in, you know helping with informed security decision making, right? And I think it's a, a unique journey. You know, I, I I was excited to be friends with you and to walk through that and see how how it progressed because a lot of organizations don't have intel. Or they do, but they're struggling to get traction, to get you know buy-in, to get funding, to become important, to become valuable, to become uh, impactful. They're always worried the next budget cuts going to be you know they're going to go first, etc. And so I'd love to know more about your journey and dig in a bit on your journey at State Street from new hire to to what you built there and the successes again without violating any NDAs or anything like that, of course. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's talk a bit about that though. How's your path there? Sure. So I was actually recruited to go to uh, State Street by Mark Morrison, who I used to work for in the government. So, you know, they were, State Street was smart in bringing somebody in from the government who really understood operations, right? And um, so he was brought in as a CISO over at State Street. And him and Dee Moran were there, and I worked for, with both of them my time around DIA. And he's like, I told him I was looking for something, and he's like, well, I, I've got, you know, Got something in mind. And, and actually, I, I was seconded when I first went to State Street. So I didn't go to State Street in a sense. I was hired on by State Street to support the Financial Systemic Analysis and Resilience Center. Oh, so up yeah. to this point in my career, I had been active duty military. I had worked for large and small contractors, seated contractors, and been civil service. So I had done like 
almost everything you could do for the government, except I'd never been a partner with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this gave me an opportunity to come out of, you know, directly supporting the government to partnering with the government to help in this mission to protect the critical infrastructure of the financial services system. So really big mission. I was very mission focused. I still am. You know, this was protecting your retirement or your money, you mm-hmm. know, for State Street's behalf, it would be retirement. But for, you know, other partners that we had, your ATMs that you went to to get money out of or, you know, your bank accounts where your check was deposited, things like that. So we, we have the systemic risk, which, you know, could proliferate across the, the, the financial system. Mm-hmm. And so I was actually uh, brought on board uh, by Mark and Dave to make sure that we set up our intelligence function. So I was mm-hmm. uh, intelligence lead for that. And I actually helped build the FS ARC at the time. Now it's just the ARC. So mm-hmm. we, we dropped the financial sector. But yeah, it was really good uh, opportunity to uh, take everything that I had done in my past. And I had helped March uh, stand up a couple organizations previously. So you knew I had that experience. So really establishing those relationships with our government partners and our peers to determine and define what does it mean uh, to, you know, not just identify the, the risk, but to protect against those systemic risk uh, and threats to the financial sector. So partnering with the government was a big deal. So I did that for uh, about a year and then I went to State Street. Um, so I can't say I went back to State Street because I never mm-hmm. worked there proper. And then I uh, worked as the SecOps director. So I was the security operations manager, I guess. Uh, I handled, handled incident response and all of our security tools and intelligence. And we had a couple of MSSPs. Mm-hmm, I, so mm-hmm. I did that for a few years. And then 2020, uh, y'all know what happened in 2020. Well, we had a CISO change there and, you know, I got a peak as actually probably when I really got interested in, in the CISO world, mm-hmm. I got a big glimpse into what that, that took and what, you know, what it, what it means to be a CISO. And, and I guess probably started thinking maybe that might be, you know, something good for my career path. But we got a, a new CISO in towards the end of the year. Um, and then she asked me to focus on intelligence. And so I uh, became the head of uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, for State Street. And in that, I was allowed to build a team, which I have to say was a rock star team. I uh, love that team still. And we uh, built out adversary modeling, which some people call threat modeling. I like mm-hmm, ch- mm-hmm. to call it that because everybody thinks of software. Sure. But trying to identify those those threat actors uh, deemed the greatest uh, threat to us so we can make mm-hmm. sure we had the defenses in place, brought in the right tooling that we needed and the, and the right people and just developed a bunch of products and had to fight for budget, had to fight for, you know, all of that to be able to get oh, them. Let's talk about that for a second. So that's that's where, sorry to interrupt you and dig in on the hardest part, but that's where people talk to me a lot about, hey, if you get to the point where they hire a, an Intel professional or somebody internally you know gets it and wants to do this, right? I hear over and over again, the challenge is getting buy-in, getting Mm -hmm. budget. You know, how do I convince leadership that this is going to make us safer? It's proactivity. I may or may not have metrics to support it right away. Like, do you have any insider tricks on how do you, how do you justify, you know, budget and, and a process? Like, you know, do you come in and ask for a giant number? Do you come in and say, I just want a little bit and try to, you know, nibble away at it? Like, what was your secret to success? Yeah. I think first and foremost is being able to tell a story. Even as a CISO, you have to be a good storyteller, right? And it's you got to show that return on investment. Uh, what is it that you're going to get out of this tool? How's it going to impact my risk? How's it going to impact my bottom line? How's it going to enable me to make better decisions? So you really have to be able to tell that story and why we want to invest in this uh, program. Mm-hmm. I was very fortunate that my CISO understood the value of intelligence. And so, well, yeah, Mark, right? Mark, or was Mark gone by then? And Liz. Uh, Liz was the last yeah, Liz, one. That's right. Joyce. Yeah. And she, definitely understood intelligence and the value of it, which is why she asked me to build that for her, right? And so not everybody is that lucky in that they get somebody who actually just already understands it. So while storytelling is important, the support at the top is probably the key. So you have to have that across all of cybersecurity. You've got to have that support at the top. And I mean, even Mm -hmm. now you've got SEC saying we've got to have CISO presence or, you know, that kind of skill at the board level. Yeah, it's thankfully, that mu- that much of an important aspect of, of all business, right? Cyber is a business mm-hmm. problem; it's not a security problem. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you have that buy-in, and then don't ask for an elephant. Like, take it a buy at a time. <laughs> like, I don't want to buy some big, beautiful, majestic elephant. I just need this mm-hmm. one capability, and then you get that capability work, and then you add another capability. Because be realistic, 
if you try to buy everything at once and you don't have the people, you can't build it all at once. That's right. No, you got to do it a little at a time. I think that's the best way to do it in order to be successful. At mm-hmm. least that's what I've, I found it has worked for me. So that that's how I would go at it is just a little mm-hmm. bit at a time and then be a very, very good storyteller. I think those are, those are huge points. I will say it's interesting. So I, I took a slightly different path. But not entirely, right? So the last, you know, large project I took on to build the program, I did have a leader who was advocate, which helps to Devin until background, but this was an advocate. And so I I wanted to go with a little bit of a shock and awe. I was like, let's find out if you really want to invest in this. Like, let's look what the far end is going to be. So I, I projected out like perfect case scenario, global team, different areas, all the tools and everything with a really big number, knowing I couldn't get it all today. But I was like, let's find out. I, what I didn't, what I feared, and, and you overcame this, but I feared getting a little nibble and then just not getting any more, right? And it's, you know, just enough so they could check a box. And now I'm frustrated as an Intel guy because, you know, as we have a small team and we can't actually accomplish anything. I can't count the number of companies I've run into or massive team and you find out their Intel is one person and that person actually has three other jobs. And you're like, uh, you're not really doing Intel. So I came in with like this giant grandiose picture. And then from there it was, okay, it's stages, right? Okay, we're not gonna do all the day, but these are all things we want. But I want you to get the budget now. I was telling the CISO then, I was like, we should try to secure all of this. So it's available. I got very lucky in that we got almost all of it. And then I spent it all immediately because, you know, good old government background. When you get money, you spend it. You don't sit on it because they can take it back any day. And so us, we spent a lot really fast. People, tools, everything. I also hired a few people from the government. So I had people with background that could hit the ground running, which helped. And then lo and behold, when budget cuts came, they came looking to cut things. I said, well, you can't cut anything. I've already signed through your contracts with everybody. And we've already hired these people. There'd be no reason to get rid of the people. We've already paid for the tools. Get rid of the tools because they're already contracted. You might as well keep the people. So uh, yeah, old government trick for anybody who's never been in the government. When you get budget, uh, we've always been taught, make sure you spend it and spend it. Spend Everything. it well, but spend it quickly and spend it all. Yes. <laughs> Don't leave any behind because they'll assume you need less next year. And locking in three-year contracts, you know, I was able to justify it. We did get better pricing. Uh, but I also knew it insulated my team from cuts. I had a hunch budgets were going to cut eventually. And you can't, they're not going to cut something that's already paid for and, and committed. They're not going to cut the people that are doing it because they might as well at that point, some mm-hmm. cost. So, but I think, I think your point on storytelling is huge. You know, being able to explain, I think you mentioned two things we talk about all the time, which is you got to be able to tie it to somebody's risk uh, and somebody's bottom line, right? That's all, in my opinion, that's all I've seen that leadership cares about or can mm-hmm. care about, frankly, is does this make us safer in a measurable way or does this make us more money? Uh, either cutting costs or, or raising revenues, right? And if you can't do those things, it just seems so hard. So it's nice to hear that you had the same the same experience in terms of trying to get the budget through. And then, so so okay, you've 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 been recruited, you've moved your way up in the company, you've been you had a change in CISOs, another brilliant CISO comes in, and you guys want to go intelligence driven, and so you're building this Intel team, and you're you're taking bites away. So then, how are you reporting back and showing those metrics the, the, that risk is lowering, that you know progress is happening, I need yeah. more, we need to build the next layer? How are you doing that? I think the work that we were able to do during COVID and Russia, Ukraine really helped, not to keep going back to that, but sure. we really had the spotlight on us. So at first, they're like, why are you reporting on COVID? Or why are you report? What do we, you know? What why are you reporting on the Russia? I mean, we were reporting on Russia Ukraine before it happened, right? Like yep. Yep. we were trying to prep, and we had some people are like, "Well, this isn't going to impact us," and we're like, "Oh yeah, it will." You know, you just don't know how yet. So we just you know trying to get that in, and then during COVID, we actually briefed every single day to our C suite. Oh, nice. Here's wow. here's the threats we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Here you know here's what we we're going what's going on around the world. I'm bringing in a lot of the data that we were getting from our information sharing channels that we had. And then we really just got, and it became where people started knowing who you were. So we, mm-hmm. we actually presented our value, you know what I mean? On a daily basis, people were seeing what value they can get out of the work that we were doing. And mm-hmm. it just kept growing from there. And so when Russia, Ukraine kicked off, it was immediate. Like we were running the daily briefings. We were running yep. all of that to, to advise our uh, leadership and, and our peers uh, on what they needed to know from that perspective. So I think those two events were instrumental in our success because when we said we needed something, we were able to get it and justify right. it because we, they were able to see the results immediately. It wasn't like strategic activities. This was tactical activities that happen every day, right? But then, you know, by being able to build out our team, then we were started being able to be really strategic, looking out with Okay, we've got this stuff going on. These are the long-term impacts. These are the things we need to think about. We started getting mm-hmm. involved in M&A, which, by the way, if you don't have Intel involved in M&A, we'll talk oh, about that. Oh, God, please do. Yes. Preach. Um, 
I've been talking yes. about this too. Got to get involved. It's, M&A is not just, do, do they fit our portfolio and do they have any open lawsuits against them? And no offense to people doing M&A. I know there's more to it than that. And you're a lot smarter than I am in a lot of business stuff. So I'm not trying to pick fights. So, so much value. Oh, please, so oh, much value. Yeah. Yes. Please get um, Intel involved. The threats, it's unbelievable. The risks that yeah. people take on and don't realize it. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize we bought a pig in a poke. Mm -hmm. But you sure did. Yeah. <laughs> and then during COVID, also supply chain attacks, right? Mm -hmm. We were able to... Up. Oh my gosh. Like we, we just ratcheted uh, the support there on all of our third, fourth, fifth, I just call it nth party. Because then you learn, oh, by the way, yeah, I've got this third party, but they've got two other, you know, vendors that are working for them that are preventing me from getting that service. That really shined the light on that. So all these different scenarios were, were proving the value of what we were doing. So we didn't just have the support of, of our team, but others in the company, because they started coming to us asking for help. So I was really good. You know, any, anytime we got in any kind of new business function or trying to build something, they would come to us and ask for help. So really mm -hmm. just that being able to show and be on the on on stage, if you will. We were providing regular briefings, we were regular products out, and it was just it was great. We were rocking and rolling. And it geopolitical events have a huge impact on business. And I don't think that that's well known. Talked about enough or accepted enough. I agree. Yeah. Uh -huh. so. I think that's, you know, one of the things that we probably should talk about more because there is a cause and effect there, right? Sure. Sometimes okay. it takes a little longer to realize it, but there's definitely cause and effect there. But well, I think that, that's they're so successful. Yeah. And that ties into, you know, obviously, again, the name of the show, right? Yeah, for this episode, you know, talking about if you're not, you know, if you're not proactive, you're chasing the threats, right? If you're not doing intel, by definition, if you're not doing intel, you're not proactive. I talk to CISOs all the time. They all say they want to get ahead of threats. We want to be proactive and then ask them how much they're investing in intel and suddenly the crickets are chirping. And I have to give the bad news that you're not proactive. Like by definition, you're not. Well, you know, as soon as we got a signature, we reacted or we, you know, we took action. Well, that you reacted. It was in your environment already. Even if nothing bad happened yet, I get it. You're early in the reaction side, but you're reacting. Proactive is being able to see things that haven't happened yet. Like, like you were talking about, why do we care about Russia and Ukraine? Why are you talking about this? A war hasn't even broken out yet. But an Intel leader says, we've got to look at the possibilities, the potentials. Now you can't look at everything. Of course, we can't spend on every possible scenario. So but that one seemed like a likely challenge. You, you obviously were able to see it as a lot of other people, you know, did and said, Hey, this could have major impacts on, you know, global economics and shipping and all sorts of different things. Right. And to be ahead of the curve. Now I, I suspect when things started happening, you picked up a lot of credibility along the way, like, well, Lisa told us this was going to happen or that this might happen. At least probable possible, you know, again, you know, the, the term terminology we use and cause I've seen some of the same things. But as you said, people, I think there's still not enough discussion or investment or willingness to invest in strategic because metrics can be difficult. You know, we tell you about world events every day and you know what's going on and potentials, et cetera. A lot of those things don't become anything or they do in eight, nine months. And you've forgotten somebody briefed you eight nine months ago about it. But if you don't understand the global picture, you know, people talk about globalism all the time. We're all connected to everybody at this point, pretty much, right? Whether it's supply chain, whether it's financial systems, whether it's pharmaceuticals, we're all kind of connected, right? So I think I still struggle with organizations that are just tell me about threats to me. Like I was really, really myopic. I get that that's important. Don't get me wrong. We'll always tell you about threats to you. Some go, well, just my industry. Okay, it's getting better. Well, just my geography. Oh, I'm getting a little better, but it's really all of the above, right? And helping people understand that because a lot of those things in, in my experience, and you tell me if you're seeing it differently, the further away you get from the target, from yourself, the metrics get tougher, right? Because, you know, okay, Russia, Ukraine, two months before it happened. Well, why are you telling me this? Well, here's the importance to it. But I can't tell you today the money we spent and the time we spent making this report, you can't do anything with it. Like it's not actionable, right? So a lot of folks keep talking about actionable intelligence, actionable, actionable, which I think is really, really important, of course. But I spent a lot of time saying you got to also remember the value of informational because that often becomes actionable. You know, I used to say in the government, you know, we had tens of thousands of intel analysts and everybody's not focused on just China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Somebody is studying Bolivia someplace. I don't think Bolivia is a threat to us. I haven't heard anything about it. But if tomorrow Bolivia becomes a threat, tomorrow's way too late to start learning about Bolivia. And the government prints money so they can, they can hire people to sit in corners and study all the countries. And we can't do that in private sector, of course. But it feel like you've got to be able to expand that aperture, right? And, and that's why people like you, like intel leaders in these positions who, who, as we said, think differently, see the world differently, are able to stand and can tell good stories to prove the points are able to say, I see some things that you might not see. I mean, probably a more polite way to say it, but you know, I see the world differently and there are some other things on the horizon that I think are worth investing time and energy to understand because if bad things happen, you're caught on the back foot. I mean, imagine if you hadn't done that work at state street 
and prepared for the possibilities with Russia and Iran. Russia and Ukraine, not Iran, as far as I know. Russia and Ukraine. Don't uh, yeah. I'm not making new news over here, anybody. Uh, so I don't think they're at war. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, or, or as you said, as COVID was kicking off, right? How is this going to affect us? You know, m and I mean, you mentioned that. I got to dig in really quickly. I won't call out names, but a while ago, I had a customer, a different company. They were massive pharmaceuticals, it turns out, was not GSK. Yeah, they were an Intel customer, and they came to us and said, hey, we've got a challenge. Our CEO has just publicly announced a partnership with a quote-unquote non-government organization from China. And we don't know anything about the organization or any of the rest, risks or threats. And I said, okay, well, that's challenging. This isn't quite M&A, but it's in, the, it's in the ballpark, right? So we did the research. We had a brilliant person do this. And lo and behold, this non-government organization in China, you'll be surprised to know it wasn't quite non-government. Turns out their office was co-located with, well, it was 2PLA at the time, I think. And all the people that were on their, their org chart, well, we got pictures of all of them in Chinese military uniforms as well. And so then we have to report this negative news back that says, hey, I got some bad news for you. You should probably not do this arrangement. Well, we can. It's already public. It's already announced, et cetera. And so well, then you should expect all of your IP to end up in Beijing because there's massive risk here. There's massive threat. There's a pattern here that suggests now, if you, even if you tried to back out, they're probably just going to try to steal it from you anyway. And sadly, the response to this wasn't, thank you. Oh, my God, great intel. We should try to at least prepare ourselves, look for things. But the response was, we can't tell our CISO this. We can't tell our CEO this. We'll get fired. So they fired me instead. I was like, oh, okay, well, that, that, that'll that go well. I'm sure that, that fixes your problem. Like, feel free to turn the lights off and pretend that the room isn't infested. You'll be fine. Like, it's good. Yeah, I don't believe anybody's still from that org, works at that org anymore. But I mean, it was, it was a wake up for me when I realized, you know, yeah, yeah. I, was, I mean, it was a wake up call for me. It was the one that crystallized. I got to start telling people more about get us involved in M&A, get us involved in partnerships before they happen. Because I don't think I'd quite talked much about that until that moment. I realized, oh, man, we're way late now. I would have hoped they would have asked us the question before they did this. But also, we hadn't educated them that this is an area where Intel belongs or where we should help. So I own some of it, too. And I was like, man, we've got to start banging the drum. Please don't get into partnerships without talking to Intel. Please don't acquire companies without talking to Intel. Go on. Yeah, and pre-deal. Yes, first, pre-deal. First. Yeah, after it's too late. Yeah, I can't help you then. Right. Once the horse is out of the barn, don't don't ask me what we should do about the door. You're right. No, pre-deal. Like I've worked with orgs now. I work on Intel requirements a lot with organizations because, as you know, most organizations don't have Intel requirements. Most don't even know what they are. It takes somebody like you or, or me or some others out here to say, hey, we got to talk about how to make this systematic. And I talk to people in those Intel requirements about you know, acquisition. M&A is one of the categories I talk about. And who do you work with on this? And how do you get into that cycle? How do you get in with the execs and the lawyers, et cetera, and show value? Because I, they all want to do well. And if they understand the risks, and, and I'm sure every one of them probably has a horror story about a company they bought and didn't realize. How about that third party risk? Company looks great. They're clean. Well, if you dig a little deeper, you find out that the next layer, everything they do is in some area that's, you know, either physically risky, you know, hostile, or maybe they're not vetting people well who they're hiring and there goes all your IP out the door, you know, because they got some, you know, somebody in a, in a third world country who's underpaid and has a chance to sell your IP. I think those are all areas where we have opportunities to educate folks on how to be more proactive. Again, this whole proactive approach, get ahead of the deal. Get Intel involved. You're already paying for this Intel team. You bought the tools. You bought the people. You got a Lisa on board who's amazing and <laughs> sees the world differently and is brought in these rock stars. That was a great team. I'm sure the one you have now is great too. You got to use them. You know, I tell people a lot of times it's about value. You've already spent the money. You want value. Put Intel into more places. Stop burying it in the sock. I mean, I know you think this way too. Like rise it up, right? And you did some of that, right? You were able to elevate Intel and, and, and support more groups like Insider, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, and physical and all these places. So like, it was amazing to see that journey, you know, and, and what you what you did there was was outstanding. But now I got to transition, right? So we got one more question. So now that you're not doing that, now that you're on the CISO side of the wall, right? You're, you're not actively doing Intel. You're not, you're not leading an Intel team. I know you still work with them. But now that you're on the CISO side, right? The, the dark side, perhaps. Sorry, she says. <laughs> so, but now that you're over there, I got, I mean, a, a couple questions with it, kind of a question, sub question. Like, first of all, are you still an advocate for investing in Intel driven security? It's easy for me to talk about all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm an Intel guy. People say, well, he's a vendor. Of course, he advertises for Intel. They sell it, you know. But now, as the customer side, which I consider CISO to be customers, are you still an advocate for investing in Intel driven security? And then the, the, the second piece is, what, if anything, being on that side of the wall, what, if anything, do you see differently? How's your perception changed, your perspective changed on, on Intel, on security, on, on all these things we've been talking about? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so a thousand percent, definitely. I mean, if you can't tell that by what I've been talking about, I'm quite passionate about intelligence. And 
I've seen my role now is, uh, you know, taking intelligence to the C-suite, so to speak, making sure that they they can understand the value of that intelligence, again, for decision advantage. But being on this side, I can, you know, see how we can better use intelligence to support our operations. You know, it's it's really important to, to be able to connect those dots, so to speak. And you're right, there's not a lot of intelligence professionals on this side of the house. So we have kind of a different perspective. And again, we think differently. So we're going to be thinking about risks differently. We're going to be thinking about threats to those risks differently and, and being able to, to make sure that that folks around me understand that value. Luckily, our CISO here understands the value of intelligence. So you see a theme, I'm working for people who understand the value of intelligence. So, you know, I, I think it's so good because, you know, when they don't understand, it's harder. But when they do, they're understanding and getting that value out of it. So even my boss's leaders want to see that intelligence. So it's it's really heartwarming to see that uh, transition and, and and that happen around the company. So I think it's it's really good to have that. You still have to think about the bottom line. You still have to think about your return on investment. You got to make sure you've got the right partners. You got to make sure you don't have overlap of your tools, you know, things like that. So looking at it from a holistic perspective, do we have the right protections? Do we have the right capabilities? And so part of my job is to make sure we have those right tools, right? My team's responsible for building those tools. If we don't have them, I make sure that the, the defenders have the right tools to secure the company. So seeing it from that perspective, it just it, it actually is teaching me in the same process. I'm teaching them, but they're also teaching me uh, because I was brought here to help build what we need because I know what we need because I've mm-hmm. been there, right? And and seeing that that part of it is, is really good. But on that return on investments, always about, you know, what am I getting for my dollar or my pound in this case? You right. Know, we, British company. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That we, we, we've got the right stuff in place. I think that's really uh, where I'm seeing the value and it's a two way street for me now. Mm-hmm. I think you're always learning in your career. You never should stop learning. And this is yet another path for me to, to learn. And I just think it's good, but and mm-hmm. that's my perspective. So you mentioned, you know, that you've been lucky in that the last few places you've been, you know, you've worked for CISOs that understood Intel, right. And, and now y- you do as well. Is that luck? Is that is that intentional? Are you interviewing CISOs? Are you choosing positions? Are you do you read a CISO's resume before you decide if you had an interest in going there? You know, I, I will tell you, you know, uh, I do. So, you know, I I've gotten to the point now where I, I have friends who say, you know, what do you think about this gig? And I I generally start by reading the CISO's resume first. I'm like, uh, this is likely to be what this person's background, based on their background, this is likely to be how they think about things. This may be a harder path. This is somebody who's a straight technologist. No, maybe it won't be. I don't discount. But, uh, you know, whereas somebody came out of the government, I'd be like, all right, this is the org they were in. They're really, they're probably gonna be really deep on this, et cetera. Have you done the same things when you've made these moves to kind of, you know, say, is this a CISO I think I'm going to blend well with? Are they going to get the value of Intel? Is it going to be a harder sell or an easier sell for me? Absolutely. I mean, I think that you're interviewing as much as, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you when you're, especially when you're at this level, right? And you're going into Mm -hmm. To a new place. And I actually, you know, told my current CISO, it's uh, Mike Elmler. And I said, mm. if you want me to come, I'm bringing intelligence with me. Mm. I can't sure. not because that's my life. You know, that's yep. who I am. It's it's inbred in everything that I do. Mm. And he just smiled. He was so happy. <laughs> right. And he says, you got it. I said, because, you know, that's that's how I'm going to be. And and really, I think, you know, he he mentioned that one of the values that I bring is is that threat driven lens of uh, being okay. able to, to identify what threats can make our risk be realized. And, um, and that was a lot, we've talked a lot about that before I decided to make that, that move. Uh, so it's really important to have those discussions so that he can understand, you know, what I'm bringing to them just as much as I'm going to get out of, of that relationship as well. So it was very important for me to, to still be able to, to bring that intelligence lens and even though I'm not responsible for intelligence, still be able to uh, impart my experience in, you know, been doing this forever. So, you know, I've got a lot to teach, I think. Um, so mm-hmm. the fact that they're willing, willing to let me do that was, was really good and, and necessary for me. That's yeah. I think that's fantastic. So uh, being on that side, so I, I'm going to ask you, may not be able to answer this one. We'll see. So, you know, we talked earlier about the frustrations in building Intel teams a lot of times, especially on the CISOs is, you know, winning them over, getting budgets, you know, listen, I'm going to focus on the, the budget one for a minute, right? Is, you know, budget and value, et cetera. Now that you're on the other side and you get to see the bigger budget, the CISO budget, I don't see on my side when I'm begging for for my, you know, change. Mm-hmm. Is, is do you see it differently? Is it, do you have better understand? You don't necessarily have to share anything. I'm not asking you to give away any secrets, but better understand how CISOs think about budget versus how I think about it when I'm trying to build an Intel team. And, you know, without giving away too much, are they right? Like, should I stop beating up CISOs trying to get money out of them? Should I, is there something we should be doing on this side to better understand 
and and connect as opposed mm-hmm. to just going, you're not spending enough on Intel. I mean, I just said that earlier. You want to be proactive, you don't spend on Intel. You know, I, I admit there's some some blaming to that and some finger pointing, which isn't necessarily constructive. So is there anything you've learned on the other side of the fence that you can throw over and help say, hey, here's some ways to better connect on these things? Yeah. So first and foremost, Intel's not the only thing the CISO spends money on. What? What? <laughs> I didn't know that either. So I figured yeah, I was Well, that. you really have drank the Kool-Aid now, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I used to always think it was just me, but you know, we have <laughs> myriad of different, you know, capabilities mm. that we're trying to provide for the organization from governance, governance, uh, risk and compliance to resiliency, our SOC operations, uh, intelligence, um, you know, all the different functions that we do. And, and you, you only have a, uh, certain amount of money to be able to spend across all of that. So you have to have very good, strong leaders under you that also know that. And they're realistic about what they come back for and ask. And then you always have to have, you know, things in the background, making sure that we're spending the right money on things, kind of like auditing yourself, right? Making sure that, uh, you know, if Intel needs something, do we have to take that away from another area? And it's really about a balancing act. It's about making sure that we're putting our money where we need it the most, and then all, rebalancing that a lot, right? You, you can't start at the beginning of the year and say, this is what we're going to spend our money on because things happen throughout, throughout the year, things change, and you need to adjust. So it's being able to adjust as well, but have good program managers, you know, good chiefs of staff, good leaders uh, that can help you with all this because the CISO can't do it by themselves. They just who can't. does the CISO trust the most? I know this is a generalized question, but who do you, in your experience, who do you think the CISO trusts the most? When they go to advice... You know, they've, they've gone through all this. You, you've you've mm-hmm. talked to all the vendors. You've, you're trying to figure out and juggle what's staying, what's going. We don't have enough money for everything, et cetera. Like, who generally do you think has the most? Is it the chief of staff? Is it the person who runs the SOC? Is it their puppy dog on the car ride in? Like, who do you think is the CISO whisperer? So I, I think it depends because there's so many different functions. I think in a lot of ways, the chief of staff does. I think a lot of ways, the SecOps person does. I think it just, it truly depends on what's actually going on. And that's why I, I, I stated you have to have strong leadership across all your teams. Those people have to be able to communicate and talk about the problems or whatever it is they're seeing and be able to negotiate amongst each other so that when the CISO asks, we're not telling different stories. We're right. all on the same page. We're all in this mission together and we're all fighting for the same thing. And we, and it's a give and take, right? So I think it depends. I'm not to dodge your question. No, but no, I've it's good. No, I figured it might. It, it's I've seen it in different ways, right? Yeah, that makes sense. It was not I mean, an easy question. I mean, it's, there's, there's no I'm the, one I'm the answer, whisper. I'm sure. How's that? <laughs> You're the CISO whisperer. All right, that's good to know. All right, got to talk to, gotta talk to Lisa <laughs> offline later about that and see how they're, how they're doing. I know they're Intel driven, so I'm sure, you know, Zero Fox will be happy right. to chat with you guys about all the Decision things we advantage. do too. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure I'm sure we could chat about that for a while. All right. So we're rolling in on the end here. Those are the three big questions. But, you know, as with every episode, I like to close. I got a bonus question uh, for all the guests, which is kind of a challenging one sometimes. But, you know, so the name of the podcast is Unspoken Security. So tell me something you've never told anyone, something that's you know so far been unspoken. Wow. Huh. Mm. You talk, talk about a few things. I think, man, I think probably whenever I took the role at State, State Street to come into State Street, our CISO between Mark and Liz was Adil Saeed. And uh, the first thing he he wanted me to do was a MSS recompete. And I said, are you crazy? He says, why? And I said, because I don't know State Street. I don't know <laughs> operations. I, I'm an Intel professional. I, you know, I don't know this stuff. He's like, right. you're going to be fine. You, you're neutral. You're not jaded. You're going to be able to make right decision. Okay. Sure. That, okay. That, about halfway through that process, I want you to be a set ops director. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> now, for me, talking to the CISO, I'm asking twice if he's crazy. Right. Uh, he says, no. You're, you're going to start your new job? <laughs> yeah. He goes, you're going to do great. So he was right. Both times he was right. Like he was able hmm. to see something in me to, to do it. I didn't have the confidence in myself to do it. Right. I didn't think I had the chops. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit, we had our lead incident responder had left and I had to get called into to do incident response because it rolls up to me because my sure. responder was there. I was scared out of my mind. I was like, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. So I get on the phone and, and what I haven't told you is that I am a, a, a certified FEMA instructor for teaching uh, emergency response uh, disaster management. Oh, wow. Put that wrong, disaster response, emergency management. And so I actually teach this to civilians on how to be safe in your neighborhood. 
And I've had incident commander training and that just kicked in and I just took charge and I did fine. And I was like, I was afraid I was going to make the wrong decisions. I was afraid I was going to say something stupid, you know, cause I'm not an IT kind of person. I mean, I've had right. IT since, but I'm not an IT person, you know, <laughs> and I, and my training just took over. And I guess the point of that is like, if you're in a situation and you think you can't do it, just rely on what you know, uh-huh, you know? Uh-huh, go uh-huh. back to what you know and you'll be fine. And it, and it really was, it, it, it was, it was hard, but it was fun and it was good. And in the end, I learned a whole lot and, uh, the incident response, I actually love doing incident response today. So now did anybody know, either did you tell people, Hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to figure it out. Or did anybody figure it out? Or did you, is this a fake it till you make it? That like, was a fake you, it. You utilize I'll, people? I'll admit it today that that one call was a fake it till I make it thing. Cause I was on, on the inside, I was scared on the outside. Mm-hmm. It was fun. I think, you know, it's funny. This is becoming a bit of a pattern. I've had some of these conversations. Obviously, I'm early to do the podcast here. We don't have a lot of guests yet and some some that haven't, you know, been public yet, but will eventually. But there's a there's a bit of a pattern in our industry, uh, I think. And I don't know if it's other industries, it's the only one I know. A lot of people have a similar it may it may not this, it's a different piece, but a lot of I had an opportunity to do something. I wasn't quite certain I could or couldn't do it. I hadn't done it before or whatever, but I, I just jumped in and did it right. Somewhere between I, I want, you know, about taking the risk and, or about having confidence in yourself or just, you know, it had to get done or, or I wanted the job or whatever it might be. Right. There's, it seems I'm starting to wonder if that isn't something in the nature of people in our industry that it's just, I'll figure it out. Like we're, you know, a lot of bright, bright, confident people, not arrogant people, but confident yeah. people say, you know what, it's got to get done. I'll figure it out. And not one yet has said it didn't work, right? Not one has crashed and burned or failed or anything. They have, in fact, just figured it out. And I think it's a good message to hear. And and it's from people high up, you know, CISOs and deputy CISOs and, you know, CEOs and leaders saying, yeah, this is this is a thing. Now, obviously, I wouldn't tell anybody like, you know, don't fake a bunch of things in your resume. Don't lie about your background. Don't 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 bite off more than you truly can chew, which I realize is a tough question. Where you're like, well, I, I can't do this. Can I? Can't I? But like you said, leveraging past knowledge you know, the fema training makes perfect sense incident commander is incident commander you know in, in a sense exactly. right mm-hmm. makes perfect sense you had the training in you you know i have i have times where i've taken things on it doesn't make sense i'm like ah, somewhere in the military training or intel training i've got something that probably relates to this i can you know i can figure this out oh so wow. my dog has an opinion on the subject apparently as exactly. well <laughs> yeah yes it, yes right it's good she's actually warning me this is how it works this is my my warning system here uh, about threats and risks but yeah, you know, it's being able to leverage past experience and say, yeah, I probably have something in the file. And it also helps us be old, uh, like I am now, you aren't, but I am, and okay. have all these experiences. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm worried because I'm going to start forgetting the experiences I should be leveraging and then, then I'm probably going to be done for. But no, I think, I think it's, it's a threat, right? I think it's, I think it's great to see, mm-hmm. you know, that you did that and then you were successful. And I, I assume it, you know, built confidence. You said now you felt, you know, you really like incident response, right? It's like a cool thing, right? You know, fighting fires. So thanks for sharing that, you know, with me and, and, and with the audience, because I think it's a message people can't hear enough that I don't know of anybody who's you know, made it, whatever made it is. I don't know if you feel like you did. I, I haven't yet. And I don't know. What from it is. <laughs> right, exactly. I, that's the other thing. None of us think we've made it. Everybody's like, oh, I think you've made it. I'm like, I've made what? But I don't know anybody who's, who's at some established level who doesn't have one of these stories where they, they took a leap. And they did a thing or, you know, this isn't the case here, but you know, some we've all got a failure story someplace too. I'm waiting for people are going to start telling me some of their failure stories. Cause I've got plenty of them, but you did it. Cause you're like, Hey, I got to take a shot. Right. And, and just being able to grow and learn from those. I think uh, it's challenging coming up to think you have to know everything, right? Are we talking about applying for jobs? You see the, you know, the, the, the job description, well, I don't, I don't have this. I'm a year short here. I'm like, I'm like, Oh my God, please just apply. And the only time I'm going to mention it is it, it, for this show is because here I see that there's a big disparity in that in guys versus women. Oh, yeah. Like I know dudes who have no experience, no qualifiers. Like, um, you know, I haven't heard of computers. I could probably be the CISO. Let me throw my resume in. And I know brilliant women who somehow have convinced themselves, well, it says seven years. And I only have six years and nine months. I should wait to apply. Oh. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, oh no, go apply. Trust me. Like that's, that's a unicorn, you know, description. You're brilliant. You're qualified. You know, have you seen that too? Oh, you've been, you've been doing this a while. Too. There, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's actually statistics out there around that. You know, women have to be about hundred percent qualified to apply where as men don't. I mean, oh, no. And even like when I was uh, applying for my civil service job, uh, they wanted a doctorate. I'm that like, seems reasonable. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> no, <Doctorate. laughs> so I still applied and I got it and I got promoted twice. You know what I mean? So it, it just don't let that stop you. 
whoever you are, if, if you mm-hmm. have a desire to want to, to do that job and you think you're even remotely qualified, go for it. Who, who, awesome. are, who are they to say don't apply, right? Yeah. Whoever they is, but you know, right. go for it. You never know because um, sometimes the opportunities that you miss out on are the ones that you don't even try for. 100%. And some of those vacancies sit for a long time because people don't apply, right? You know, you can't, yeah, it's the old cliche, you know, 100% of the shot. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Uh, yeah. But it's true. You see vacancies that go months and months and months. You're like, gosh, I wonder why nobody's taking it. And then for a while, people are like, well, it must be an undesirable job that nobody's taking the job. I'm like, no, maybe nobody applied because they wrote a terrible job description that created a unicorn status and everybody self selected out of the position without trying. I'm a big advocate in applying. Like, worst thing that happens is you won't get interviewed or you won't take the position, whatever. It doesn't yep. hurt. You know, applications yep. don't cost a lot of money. Those government ones take a lot of time, though. So you better, you better be committed if you want to work there. Very long time. I actually yeah. turned around the job once because it was, I it was offered a position uh, with the government and it was going to take eight months to place me. <laughs> eight months. They, I, I hope they are getting better at that and working on that. The government that struggles to get some of the best talent, I think, just because they run out of time. Like people, mm-hmm. people can't do that. And then of course they, they may not be competitive financially either. So eight months by then you get a job in the private sector, it's harder to reel them back in. But anyway, that's a whole different topic for another day. Absolutely. So listen, we're, we're going to wrap up here. Thank you for coming on. First of all, Lisa, thank you for making the time. Thank you for all you've done to make, you know, for state street safer and now what you're doing at GSK. Thanks for being my friend. Obviously I appreciate it. It's, it's great to be able to talk to you, not just here, but elsewhere. I learned from you all the time and I'm going to keep doing it. I took some good pieces just out of today that I hope others did as well. You know, but I, I appreciate you being on you know, with me. I hope we'll be able to get you back here at some point. You know, I'd love to to talk more about things that we can share with folks. But but thanks for coming on on Spoken Security today. I look forward to to talking with you more here and elsewhere. I look forward to more opportunities. And thanks for everybody who's listened to this podcast. I hope you'll continue to to tune in. And, and I hope we're we're both entertaining and informational. Uh, and if we're neither or one but not the other, feel free to let me know. Please try to be kind about it. It's not the easiest gig, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll throw tomatoes if you need to, whatever it takes. But anyway, that's it. We're going to wrap up this episode of Unspoken Security. And until next time, uh, thanks everybody. Talk to you soon. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of Unspoken Security, brought to you by Zero Fox, the only unified external cybersecurity platform. If you enjoyed this episode, follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. See you next time.